all say amen. Amen, brother. Let us all say amen again. Amen. Amen again. For God has blessed us to be here this morning with mobility in our limbs and sanity of mind. Yeah. Well, at least most of us, sanity of mind. <laughs> uh, for the purpose of worshiping Him in spirit and in truth mm -hmm. and encouraging each other. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse number 16. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, thank you for the prayers that have been prayed, the scriptures that have been read, and the songs that have been sung. Oh no, Brother Matthew must have had a good breakfast this morning. <laughs> yes, sir. He was digging, he was digging deep, deep, deep within him, <laughs> within himself. Miraculous Massey. Amen. <laughs> and always glad to have a uh, nephew with us and, and my good friend the Nortons. Always glad to have them. Amen. 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 We always got room for the Nortons. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Here at the Hubsmith Church of yes, Christ. Sir. Yes, sir. Mark chapter 9, verse number 16. Listen to what the Bible says. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said to them, He answered, and, he answered him rather, and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bow with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him immediately, the spirit convulsed in him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe all things are possible, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Let me read that again. Yeah, yeah, that's if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Prepare for the possible. We know that things in life don't stay the same. Yeah. We, we know that, right? Yes, sir. Yes. And when changes come, especially the unforeseen changes, mm -hmm. we like to be prepared for them, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. I remember as a kid, and I'm sure you remember as a kid, before you took a road trip, our parents told us to prepare for the trip by going to use the restroom first. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Because once we got on the highway, didn't know if we were going to pass by one. Didn't know if the place that had one would have one in a condition where we could be comfortable resting and relieving ourselves. Yeah. Just didn't know what was ahead. Yeah. So we were told to prepare by going to the restroom first. We today make preparation for things that are possible. We, when we leave home, 
we have our cell phones with us. I know there's an entertainment value to it, but we know that if we get stranded or have to stop on the side of the road, we can just pick up that cell phone and call somebody. We prepare for things ahead. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we get warranties on things that we buy. We get insurance because even though we don't know what the future holds, we know what the future possibilities are. And in this passage, we see Jesus' disciples who had an opportunity to uh, cast a demon out of a man's son. However, they were not able to do it. And in this passage where we read in Mark chapter 9, we see a series of things that occur. We see the scribes arguing and disputing with them. We see Jesus on the scene and someone in the crowd ran to him and told him what happened. Mm -hmm. We see a father who is hurt. We see a son who is possessed. Yeah. We see a Lord who is disappointed. However, in spite of his disappointment, mm -hmm. in verse number 29, he does give instruction, doesn't he? He says in verse 29, and we'll connect the dots uh, later. So he said to them, them being his disciples, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And they, he made that statement because the disciples wanted to know why were they not able to cast the demon out of that man's son. They had faith. They believed in who Jesus was. They knew what Jesus was able to do. They had even agreed to follow him. This is why they're referred to as his disciples. However, they could not do what he was able to do. And Jesus said to them that the type of faith that it takes to do what he did with regards to casting out that demon was the result of prayer and fasting. And so I ask a question. Are we ready for the possible? Oh, we prepare for the things in life that possibly can happen. Mm -hmm. Not saying that they will happen, not saying that they won't happen, but we know that it's possible that, the, that some things can happen. Yeah. Are we ready for the possible? Well, one of the things that we see, and this is going to be at least a two, maybe a three-part series, one of the things that we see from the outset is that the disciples were ridiculed. Look at verse number 14, if you will, in Mark chapter 9. The Bible says, And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Do we see that? Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, running to him, greeted him, and he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? So we see it from the outset. Jesus walks up on the scene, the scribes are disputing with his disciples. They were, they were, the converse doesn't give the impression that the conversation was pleasant. Right. And me, and if I was to look at it, and if we were to look at it from a human standpoint, if you have some people who are identifying with Christ, but they are not able to do what Christ is able to do, then, then instinctively somebody would have something negatively to say about them. Some criticism would arise. And so the question that I ask is, are we prepared to be criticized for our failures? We know that they are going, that it's possible that they will happen, but how ready are we to be criticized for our failures? I know when we talk about failure, sometimes we automatically go to the workplace or we go to things that we may not like, that, that things that, may have, that we may have tried uh, in the workplace professionally or even in our personal life and didn't succeed at. But I'm talking about from a spiritual point of view. Are we ready to be criticized? Are we ready to be ridiculed? 
I know, I know my church family, when we look at these verses, we see the disciples tried, and we see that they failed, and we may look at it and step back and say, well, I'm not in Mark chapter 19, I'm not one of those disciples, I'm not physically walking with Christ right now, I'm not equipped with the measure of the Holy Spirit to cast out a demon right now, but my brothers and sisters, that does not negate the question, are we ready, are we prepared to be criticized? Looking at where we are in the state of the church, of course those gifts do not exist anymore where people are casting out demons and touching folk to heal the sick, but there is an expectation that all of, the, all of Christ's disciples, there is an expectation for all of Christ's disciples in this day and time. But the question I have is, are we prepared to be ridiculed? Here's where I'm going with this, my brothers and sisters. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 and 16. I'm going to read that for us because I want to point out some things. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. The Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Are we ready for the ridicule? What aspect of the ridicule? Are we ready for that part, first of all, that says that we should be ready to give an answer when people have questions of us? This is biblical, this is scriptural, that we are expected to know why we believe what we believe. Are we ready? Are we ready to give an answer? How prepared are we to explain and to convey to others why we said yes to Jesus and why we continue to say yes to him every day, even when things in our lives aren't going the way that, they, that we would like for them to go? Are we ready to give an answer when the question is posed? But not only that, the second part of the passage, it points out that when, when, we, are, when we are accused of being evildoers, are we ready to prove them wrong by continuing to live the life that the Lord has outlined for us to live in his book? Yes. Are we ready for that possibility? But come on now, y'all got to go ahead and be honest with me, brothers and sisters. Are we ready for that possibility? Because look, these first century Christians, particularly the ones to whom Peter wrote in his epistles, they were accused of being evildoers. They endured persecution. And the only thing they had to hold on to were the words that were given to them, the, the words that were given to them uh, by, by God's preachers and God's teachers who were, who were living at that time and the life that they were expected to live. And so, and so, so when, the, when the words weren't there, when the words weren't there, when the words weren't there for them to speak, and when the words were not being spoken in their hearing, they had a lifestyle that they lived, they banned somebody, that communicated to those, to those who were not connected to Christ that Jesus was still alive, that God was still working in the affairs of people. And not only did they do that for themselves, but I want you to hear me and hear me well. Other Christians were going through the same issues that they were going through. And so when we live a righteous life, it is not only for us to get to heaven, but it is a source for us, it is, it is for us to be a source of motivation and encouragement to our brothers and sisters who are, do, who are enduring the same thing. Yes, yes. Are we ready for the possible? But going back to this, this notion of being able to, uh, to give an answer to questions when we're asked, let me set the table right quick. Please turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll get back to Mark briefly. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 23. The Bible says, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Now let's stop for a minute. Going back to answering questions, I want to go ahead and take something off the table for us right now. There are some questions, there are some people, when they have these foolish and ignorant questions, that we shouldn't even entertain with an answer. Continue to live right. 
Now that I've gotten that off the table, let's talk about the stuff that we should be able to talk about. And I challenge each of us to look at ourselves and look at how we live and ask ourselves, are we equipped enough, biblically and scripturally, to give an answer to people when they have a question about the hope in which we abide? How familiar are we with our scriptures? How much time do we invest in learning more and more and more about the will of God? How much time do we invest in learning new things as opposed to continuing to, uh, to refresh our memories on things that we already know? See, in order for this thing to work, we got to continue to add knowledge to our minds. We just, it doesn't do us any good to just stop with first principles when there are so many things contained in the Word of God. That's one of the reasons why we're studying the Minor Prophets on Wednesday nights. Because the Minor Prophets oftentimes get overlooked. But when we look at them closer, we find in so many good, helpful things for us to live by today. We've been able to learn that God, even though in his anger, he still loves us. We've been able to see that how he ties a, a long and a high tolerance. However, at some point in time, his tolerance will run out and he will get angry. It's good to know both sides of God. Yeah. It's good to know that he tolerates those that he loves, but it's also good and helpful to know that at some, at some point he has a stopping point. Are we ready for the possible? Are we ready to be ridiculed? Are we ready? Do we have enough information in our arsenal so that we can speak intelligently about our religious convictions and the things that we hold dear? Are we ready for the possibility of our moral failures? What do you mean by moral failures? The things that we do wrong, that we know are wrong, that we shouldn't do wrong even when we want to do right. But just in case we need some help and reminder of what moral failures are, please turn to a familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9. This is one of those Wednesday night scriptures. You know, we got the Sunday school scriptures. Then we got the Wednesday night scriptures, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. Us. Such were some of us, right? But the point that I'm making is that in life sometimes, we will mess up. In life, sometimes, we will mess up. The only one who lived a perfect life is the Lord Jesus himself. The Bible tells us so in Hebrews 4 that he was tested in every manner that we are, but he didn't sin. Bible doesn't say that about me. Bible doesn't say it about you either. That means that when it comes to that, we're all in the same boat. Amen and hallelujah. But the thing is, are we prepared to withstand our own moral failures? What do you mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. Sometimes when we fall down, we may do it in front of people who will hold on to it and never let us forget about it. Sometimes we will have a fall and have an impact on the lives of others. But here's what we got to remember, my brothers and sisters. We got to remember that when we were baptized into Christ, yeah. that we received justification and we received sanctification. And at the appropriate time, we will receive glorification. What do you mean by justification? Justification is God's way of saying that even though you're unrighteous, I've put something in place where you can stand before me as a righteous person. And those of us who've said yes to Christ, because of that relationship we have with him, we have access and the ability to stand before him as a righteous person. In addition to being justified, we've also been sanctified. Sanctified means that we've been set aside to use by God for his specific purpose. But then when he comes back to receive us unto himself, it is on that day we will be glorified. 
And so that was made possible by us uniting with Christ by means of baptism. Mm -hmm. And so what does that mean? What does that have to say about us? Here's what it says, is that if we fall down, keep on getting back up because not all hope is lost. As long as our Lord is alive, that means that we have the ability to get up and not only get up, but get up stronger and more encouraged than we were when we fell back down. Yeah, we may bear some scars. Yes, we may even bear some spiritual bruises. But the thing about the scars and the bruises, they don't limit or debilitate us. God is able to take that stuff and allow us to be stronger than we were when we fell down. Are we ready for that? But let me tell you something, church family, just in case we forget. Throughout the scripture, God's people have have struggled. In the book of Galatians, we see the Galatian church had turned away from the gospel. In Colossians, he told them to stop lying in chapter 3. In the book of Romans, in chapters 1 and 2, they had a whole long list and litany of moral issues. In 1 Corinthians, they had a whole lot of issues. But the thing is, in spite of their issues, they still belong to God. They were still numbered among his people. And for us, when we experience our moral failures, we still belong to God. And we're still numbered among his people. Thirdly, uh, we prepare for the possibility of having failing ideas. The disciples attempted to serve this man who had a son that was demon possessed. They had made a noble attempt, but they didn't have a positive outcome. Some would say because they attempted and it didn't happen, that that was a failure. And my brothers and sisters, there are things that we will attempt to do for the kingdom that just won't turn out as as always planned. For a number of reasons. Sometimes we can overcommit ourselves. Sometimes we can become overzealous. Sometimes we may not plan things thoroughly. We can get so focused on the outcome until we forget about a procedure being in place to make sure that the outcome happens. Sometimes we don't realize that we've overlooked things until we're in front of a group of people who are looking for us and we say, oh, there's a glitch in the program. Oh, I should have done this before I stood up. Oh, I wish I had thought about that before we set this thing in motion. And my church family, it does happen. And what I encourage each of us to do is that when we have ideas that we try to deploy and they do not go as planned, don't get discouraged. Just use them as growth experience and continue to serve the Lord. Another reason why sometimes we may fail is because we forget we are disciples and may periodically for that moment think that we're Jesus. Let me let you in on something. Jesus is the teacher. We disciples are his followers. We are his disciples for a reason. Because we can't do what he's able to do. So don't get so locked in thinking that we have Jesus' ability when we're not Jesus the individual. We are continuous, and I've said this before, lifelong learners from him. And God used him because he was so perfect to give us something to commit to for the rest of our lives. And so my brothers and sisters, what I want to remind us of is that if ideas fail, just go ahead, wash your hands, kick the dust off your feet, and just plan better for next time. But in the process of planning, include prayer as a part of your planning process. Why is that? Because we are not Jesus. The Bible still says that there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And I know how we often apply that, but don't get lost on the one Lord part. If we don't get the one Lord part down pat, then the one faith and one baptism doesn't mean anything. Lock in and learn to live and learn to love and live for the one Lord. As I get ready to close, are we ready for the possible? You know, Jesus can make impossible impossible situations possible. He can make difficult things easy. Why? Because he's in control of it all. And my brothers and sisters, what I encourage each of us to do is that as we examine our lives, ask ourselves, are we prepared for the possible? And if we're not prepared, I want to assure you and us, I want to assure us that no matter how complicated our lives are, 
It's a simple fix for Jesus. Amen. He doesn't have to schedule a weekly or a monthly session with us to fix us. Yeah. He doesn't have to write a prescription for us to, to know how to act right. Yeah. He doesn't have to refer us out to people because it's not his area of expertise. Right. He's Jesus. He's the one who's able to do in our lives what he did in the life of this boy. We see how the, all of the complications that this demon sent this boy through. Falling down on the ground, convulsing, foaming at the mouth, jumping in the water, jumping in the fire. But when Jesus shows up to the scene, he just said, come on out of it. And that demonic spirit came out. And my church family, whatever it is that's preventing us from being prepared for the possible, all he has to say is, come on out of it. Come on out of her. And everything will be all right. As I survey the audience, I see some happy people. I see some people who are committed to God. And I want to say to each of us, don't allow unforeseen things to cause our commitment to waver. But instead, allow those things to cause our commitment to grow, grow stronger. Yeah. Learn from them. And when we don't know what lessons to learn, look up and ask for his help. Amen. The Bible still says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him, let him ask from God. Amen. He's still in the blessing business. Yes, this morning, if someone's not yet a Christian, you do that through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. If someone here is dealing with encouragement issues, whether it's doubts, fears, second-guessing ourselves, that can be rectified through prayer and encouragement. If you need to respond to the invitation, go ahead and stand to your feet right now. Sing the wondrous